Welcome to another beautiful Friday as we get to know our favorite personalities only on PM Personality Profile. My guest tonight, a lawyer with 10 years experience at the bar. He's a broadcast journalist, currently host of Joy News' current affairs program, News File, Samson Ladi Anyanini. He's best journalist for the year 2019 and awardee of democracy and peace building. Congratulations, Samson. Thank you. Ashley. How do you feel about all these recognitions? Well, I've said, and I would like to state, not any differently. Um, I've met people who said this has been long coming and that this should have happened long ago. And I tell them I just work. I don't expect any award. And so when it comes, it's good. I know the DJA faculty. I have an idea the caliber and class of people who come together to determine uh, that particular price because you don't have to put in, as it were, any entry for. And if you have known me over the years, which I suspect you do, um, I don't like awards, so I never enter them. Uh, I've had occasion to turn down a couple from some groups which I believe they, their faculty was not up to scratch. Mm. We are proud of you and uh, want to say keep up the good work. But Thank also you. Ghana has been in a mourning state since the demise of the uh, former president, flight Lieutenant Jerry John Rawlings. As we mourn the ex-president, uh, I know he's a strong anti-corruption campaigner. You are also a strong anti-corruption campaigner because I remember the critical role you played in getting the RTI law passed. Even though we've not seen it functioning, uh, you played such a critical role. Now, I want to gauge your mood on the special prosecutor, the first ever, who has tendered in his resignation and the responses that are coming from the presidency, especially as he links his letter to the ex-president, uh, uh, Flight Lieutenant Rawlings, as saying that he used to be his protector right. and all of that. Mm -hmm. How does all of this come across to you? So, in the afternoon I was, I think I had gone to court, so, yeah, I had gone to court, came back and, you know, just getting ready to prepare for the next day's court activities. I, I'm literally in court every day. So, in the afternoon, I heard it, and I'm, I'm like, okay, Ghana Media, let's not get it wrong again, because we have had occasions where we have had such news which turned out to be false. Then, I discovered that almost all the media was beginning to report. And it brought memories back on the day we were reporting the death of Professor Mills. So immediately, that's what came to mind. And aside that, of course, I had to begin to ask myself, so what's going to happen to the wife? Because she draws her strength from this man, and she's in the elections as a presidential candidate. You know, he has a daughter, uh, Dr. Zenato Rawlings, who is also, you know, in a constituency where I previously voted. The, the law firm I started to work with, uh, Gazes Wenis Hughes, is in the Osu, you know, community. And so I literally lived there. So I had to register there and I used to vote there until recently when I brought my votes um, here to, you know, my area so immediately my thinking went to the wife and the children mm. and not about the country so to speak because he's played his role and um, he founded the fourth republic uh, the constitution that he superintended to birth the fourth republic the uh, longest. i make a living out of it and it's been good so far as we mourn the ex-president, uh, I know he's a strong anti-corruption campaigner. 
you are also a strong anti-corruption campaigner because I remember the critical role you played in getting the RTI law passed. Even though we've not seen it functioning, uh, you played such a critical role. Now, I want to gauge your mood on the special prosecutor, the first ever who has tended in his resignation and the responses that are coming from the presidency, especially as he links his letter to the ex-president, uh, uh, Flight Lieutenant Rawlings, as saying that he used to be his protector right. and all of that. Mm -hmm. How does all of this come across to you? Well, the, the facts, the truth, is that fighting corruption can be a very onerous job and it can be a very lonely thing to be doing. So I seem to understand him when he suggests that, you know, President Rawlings was his protector. And I would want to think that he would have, you know, many investigations that he's conducting, even seeking to prosecute people, and so on and so forth. And these are, you know, public figures, you know, politically exposed persons. And of course, you remember that we are talking about the Airbus scandal as well, and that has to do with the presidential candidate of the NDC. So uh, from all angles, it is natural in his seat to to be in a place where he will receive attacks. Um, he might even be targeted, you know, by people who may want to do him harm. Um, then, of course, there are people who would want to use influential persons, the elderly, you know, to try and reach out to him, to plead, you know, as we know, People use even religious leaders and so on to try and reach out to him to either refrain from, you know, prosecuting somebody or investigating them and so on and so forth. And when these things happen, uh, it does appear that from his tone, uh, you know, Jerry Rawlings would be one of the people that he would go to and get some support. <coughs> but. <coughs> The office as set up by the law provides him sufficient protections and guarantees uh, such that he may not need that. And as we understand, um, he has good security, you know, by the state. Yeah. And so once he has accepted to do that job, he just has to be strong-headed and go ahead and do that job. So the resignation comes as a big disappointment to those of us <coughs> who, you know, um, try to advocate and um, try to see the bit that we can contribute to change the narrative about the, the situation of corruption in the country. It's quite unfortunate, but of course, that was just by the way. Let's mm. not talk about the man something. Uh, right. I know something in the Bible was a great man. I, I don't know the meaning of your name, Ladi Anyenini, right. uh, but I know- Ladi, Ladi simply is Sunday, it's Alahare. Okay, it's corrupted. so you're a Sunday yeah, born. Just corrupted and seeking to anglicize. Mm, okay. uh, so Ladi is Alahare, it actually which means is Sunday. Ladi means Sunday in yes, Hausa, actually. in Gruni, right. So, yes. Okay. Mm. And then Anyenini simply means do not bear false witness. Oh, wow. And that's my father's name. Okay. Um, from Gambibgu in the Upper East region. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Dominic, Dominic Ayene, Dr. Dominic Ayene is my MP. Mm. Um, he, well, and, and coincidentally, where he comes from, the village where he comes from, the place where he comes from, that is uh, Zwarungu, mm. uh, which is part of the constituency, the bigger constituency, is where my mother, you know, my mother hails, yeah. Okay, mm. so you speak what, Wali? I speak Gruni. Gruni? Yeah. Oh, okay, mm. Glanwini. Glanwini. Great. Mm. So you were born in Accra, 
but you grew up in the north where specifically when Ungwa or where? okay so I was born in a clinic in Mensia in the Ashanti region okay uh, but as it appeared um, I was quickly brought to the greater Accra region and where in Nongwa, uh, where my father's brother was, and then we were in Ashaiman as well. And we stayed there for quite a long time. My father used to work with the Pania Aluminium Factory. Okay. And um, yes, yeah, so for the majority of us, myself, my, my elder brothers, Joseph, uh, Anthony, we went to the Ashaiman cluster of schools. Mm. And these days I read in the news and I find that the situation there has not changed mm. because we hear of people scaling the wall, uh, smoking around the place and even some people trying to, you know, defecate around the place and it's, it's, it shows that it, it clearly hasn't changed much. Mm. Mm. Wow. So you, you grew up in Accra. You were born in Kumasi and you grew up in Accra. Yes. So uh, we, were, we were here until I was about 12. And then we had to make our way back to Kumasi briefly and then to the village. Okay. Very briefly in Kumasi and then to the village. Uh, as in, in, in Gambibgu. Okay. Yes, in the Upper East region. And... I spent quite a bit of time there, about three years, and so by 15, I found myself back to Kumasi, mm. and I had lost some time out of school, so I had to start all over, not all over again. Um, I had to go start from class four, but somehow I went to class five very quickly. Mm. And then, before I could say Jack, um, got to class six and we're done and went to uh, GSS. Mm. So I did all of that in Kumasi. I did my primary education continuing as in after the gap from a shaman cluster of schools at uh, Nikomen Preparatory. It used to be Accra Town Preparatory and that was changed to Nikoman Preparatory. Mm. It's run by uh, some very beautiful and nice Jehovah Witness uh, people. And there's a lot of good discipline. There's very good discipline there. Um, so from the preparatory school, we didn't have a JHS, a JSS then. Mm. So we had to go to uh, JSS and I went to Amakum Eli, just by the Amakum runabout. Okay. Yeah, um, so when the I spent just about a year at that uh, GSS, uh, I don't know, but I seemed to be a, a little adventurous at the time, and needed to wanted to experiment a few things. So I asked and I got arranged, and I was I was uh, I got transferred from that place to another school. Okay. Um, that is a uh, uh, city, which is at, um, we call the place Maxima, around Maxima. Okay. Yes, so I went there. Then I did just about a year. Um, then we had to go back to the village again. So in and out of yes, the village. Yes, so we went to the village. And thankfully, when I got there, I was accepted to continue. So I went there, just accepted, continue, and finished the final year um, in Gambibgo JSS. And then um, I did well. So I got, you know, one of my choicest schools, um, Navasco, Navrongo Secondary School. And I went to Navrongo, but I did only a year there, just the first year there. Why? I got, my mother was in uh, Kumasi, so I got my mom to try and arrange something for me. Um, she, she 
didn't, couldn't really do it herself that much. But I was coming for vacation. And I come to vacation to work. Okay. So as I came to vacation one time, I realized there was opportunity at uh, Kumase High. So I quickly went, worked on my transfer. By the time I got back, I was told things were late. Oh. So I had to find a school. Yeah. Oh, wow. I got a good Samaritan who led me around until we got Asantman Senior High School. Mm. So I went to Asantman Senior High School. Uh, but, of course, it was a Santa Maria SSS. But I could not be admitted to Form 2 to continue. That was the dilemma then. So I had to step start back again. and start from, the you know, scratch. Form 1. Hmm. Yeah. So I ended up losing another year. Already I have lost years and I needed to climb up quick and I was growing. You know, and in the primary school, I was your big boy. <laughs> you know, even in the, in the GSS, I was your big, big boy, you know. And and surprising thing is, my mom had asked me, do you want to go to school or to learn a trade? Okay. You know, when I had come back from the village, do you want to go to school or learn a trade? And somehow, I, I just said I want to go to school. Wow. Yeah, I just want, I want to go to school. Um, there were issues. There was some separation amongst them, my mom and my dad, and then that threw us a bit, you know, away, and which meant that, you know, you had to eke out a living for yourself and mm. even pay school fees mm. by yourself. Mm. And that got me doing quite a bit of some work. Okay. You know. But before you yeah. tell me about those uh, stuff you were doing, um, tell me about life in the north. I mean, people say growing up in the north is such a I mean, difficult, you know, scotchy sun, mm. hamatan means a, a cracked lips. Right. And, and what of you? Right. What was your experience? Unfortunately, I didn't find it that way. <laughs> I find it very enjoying. Wow. That's how I found it. Okay. Very enjoying. Um, perhaps I was too young, uh, but what I, I met in my village, um, I met friends. I get up in the morning and we had to, I had to be a cattle wrestler, you know. Mm. So we had to take care of the, the cattle, take them out. Uh, there are sheep, there are goats. You have to go, you know, you know take care of the sheep um, and the goats. You, you attend to them. There's, mm -hmm. there's a way, I'm sure many people know how we take care of them. Um, and yeah, so you get up and that's, that's your routine. I open them up, go join with some other people who have opened up their, their cattle, cattle in their home. Then we all, you know, group in together. So maybe about five, six or four of us. Then we take care of the cattle, take them around, mm. make sure they are not destroying people's, you know, farms. That's it. You do that for the whole day and the evening you come back. So I was doing that um, for the three years that I was there. I was doing that, but I was also farming as well. Um, every home has their vast plot of land to farm because you need to farm, gather, store, uh, to take care of yourself in the, <laughs> in the dry season. Yeah. And in the dry season, we also had a place in Gambigo, we have a dam, uh, an irrigation dam. So in the dry season, you are able to also work as well. So I went there to the, you, you do a garden, and then you do a number of things, tomatoes, you know, cabbage, and the rest of them. And they grow quite quick, so you are able to uh, turn them around, take them to the market, the market. you sell and you make some money, okay. you know, yeah. Wow. So, it, I didn't see it as, as, uh, as unenjoyable. I really enjoyed my time when I was there, mm. I did. Mm. Okay, but why Kumasi, you said your, your mom was in the Ashanti region, I mean right. you're from the north. Right. Uh, what, what business do you have in the Ashanti region? Well, um, her parents lived there okay. and gave birth to her, I think, right there. 
Mm. And so she was used to that place. Okay. And so she got married to my dad and then they moved to, you know, Nungwa, Shaiman. And then as things went rough, you know, they went their separate ways. So she had to settle in there. And my dad eventually had to settle in the village. Okay. Um, but he had work at um, the Agri Ministry. Uh, they have a place at Zwarungu, so that's where he used to work. Um, what did he do? He was a security man. Okay. Yeah, so it was okay. At the end of the month, he had something small to manage, mm -hmm. but that meant, you know, you have to work and make sure <laughs> there's money. <laughs> you have to work and make sure there's money because yeah. that clearly, you know, couldn't uh, sustain uh, take care of anything, let alone uh, for a young person to get you to buy the little things you want, you know, get your bicycle properly done or get your motorcycle, <laughs> you know, that's the, the, the greatest means of transport. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so growing up in, I mean, Nungwa, Shaman means you can speak Ga? Unfortunately, my Ga is terrible, but <laughs> I can... I can say the ga that I can buy my kinky, <laughs> you know, I can buy my kinky in ga. Okay. And I should be able to, you know, board a, a vehicle in ga. Yeah. Okay. But beyond that, not much. Which, yeah. I mean, the best sentence you can, you can. Oh, uh, if you spoke, maybe I could try like, um, greetings, tell your turn, you know. It, Mahi, something. <laughs> if I'm going to buy kinky, you know, you know, in a, like how much is it? In I can say, yeah. Okay. Mm, yeah. I too. see. Yeah. I'm sure you weren't interested. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, interested I, in the language, I wasn't the attracted. Dialect. When I got to university, uh, I'm, I made a girlfriend friend in the in the University of Ghana, um, Florence and we're in the same choir together the same uh, christian fellowship together in the same choir together so she tried to tease me a bit you know try to you know but i still couldn't it's been a long time so <laughs> i've forgotten much of it yeah. share with mm. me that experience right. you you sold iced water yes i did shoe shine boy yes i did you've talked about the farming you talked yeah. about the cattle herding right how was the experience like and at what stages did you have to do this and what impact did that have on yourself and your education so to be very frank i have um, now thought about it and i don't recall that it had anything negative on me that i was getting into the trotter station and sailing ice water and, and at the time, is, it wasn't this, you know, if the you like to say, sexy, <laughs> you know, uh, you had to put it in that thing. Then you put uh, cups into one of the containers that you hold and there's water in it. So if somebody wants it, you rinse it nicely, you pull up the top and, and then you point. fetch. Yeah, you fetch it for them, you know. Um, yeah, the, the, there, was, there was a woman who sold, who had a provision shop in front of where we lived in Ashaiman and uh, so uh, she she did the ice blog and people went there to buy and go do this thing so it came very easy mm -hmm. doing and her children were my friends and, and we did that so it wasn't we didn't see it as anything um, coming to do shoe shine so that was in Akwara? That was in Kumasi. Okay. Yeah, that was in Kumasi. It wasn't much of, much of anything because um, in, in, in Kumasi, I was, assisting, I was assisting to take care of a shop, but <laughs> you needed to have a side thing, you know. So uh, I buy, I buy the shop, I have my, you know, box right there. So if I'm not selling or somebody needs to take care of their shoes, then I'm doing that. Okay. And then when we are on vacation or we are week weekends, 
then I could, you know, hang it around my shoulder and go around, go around. particularly on the KNST campus. Mm -hmm. And in, w w we had a compound house um, where they, they manufactured, so to speak, um, sponge bags. Mm. So I will add the sponge bags, I'll take a load. Of course, it's sold at a certain price, but once you take it from you know the source mm -hmm. the there's a discount then you go sell and get that you know uh, the extra on it so i'll take that and the natural place to go and get a good market was KNAC campus where students were you know yes. they needed sponge bags to use so i'll go there have my shoe shine do both of that but once in a while somebody will ask you go get me that so you put your stuff down they take care of it you go buy stuff for them and generously my hand you you know some coins then mm. you take care but I, I didn't see it as anything because I was making that like, making something Absolutely. get to school and all of that and it was it was really nothing for me okay. it was really nothing for me yeah it was really nothing I, I had friends who had this also this other work mm. um, and I'm sure um, those who are watching us from Ofori Chrome uh, will will recognize that uh, they did extension boards, wooden ones, you know, uh, Paul and Francis. Unfortunately, um, very, very unfortunately, they, 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 they have met their untimely death mm -hmm. in the most uh, devastating way. I and see. actually this Sunday, uh, I'm supposed, this Saturday, I'm supposed to be in Kumasi for Paul's funeral. Wow. And we did that. So I'll go to, I'll go to school at the Santa Mai, I'll close, come back in the afternoon, and I do that work. Um, I had some other extra job that I could do on the campus, you know, taking care of people's gardens, you know, yeah. And I did, I was, it was good. You, you ended up at where? At Santa Mai. At Santa Mai yeah. Secondary School. Mm. How was it like? Once again, a big boy around the place, and because I had my focus, and in secondary school, I was your typical Krefe guy, actually, at all times, I was in the Scripture Union leadership. Yes, so um, that kept me away from all the bad things from yeah, getting involved in anything that was bad. And of course, as a Scripture Union guy, you, you should not even be found at the, at the entertainment you know, events except that they were compulsory and even that we avoided it okay. yeah scripture union people we always avoided it <laughs> the same in the university the yeah university of ghana university of ghana uh, once again my life was um, very much restricted to a lot of um, university christian fellowship of activities and also legon pentecostals union activities um, so a lot of church things and uh, being in a choir, university, uh, as in CVC, that's the uh, Chosen Vessels Choir. Um, but later, um, I moved out of what you call spiritual leadership and went into secular leadership. Uh, and um, so right after that, I went back to Kumasi because uh, my national service took me to Love FM. Okay. Yeah, took me to Love FM. That's I did my national awesome. service there. And while I was doing my national service, I'd actually gone to Legon uh, seeking to pursue law. But the year we want, they canceled the law as an undergraduate program. Okay. So I had to do classics, uh, religion, English, and theater arts. Mm. And eventually combined major, uh, theater arts mm -hmm. and English. Um, then um, at, at Love FM, whilst I was there, I said I had set out to be a lawyer, so I'll go to law school. So at Love FM, KNUSC started the law program. So I entered the 2004-2005 academic year and started whilst I worked at Love FM. Um, I was working for Love FM, working for the BBC. Thankfully, that meant quite some good cash, particularly working for the BBC and being paid in pounds. Mm. 
it helps a great deal. So I work, then go to school, work and go to school. And uh, I got done, meaning you have to come back to Accra because you have to come to Makola Law School. So, um, I mean, when you yeah. started your national service with Love FM and then you just had a job with BBC? Yes, I, 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 got, I got the BBC job four months into my national service. Wow. And right after national service, uh, multimedia decided to maintain me. Mm. So I kept the job. You must have been very good. It was good. <laughs> I'll be sincere with you, it was good. So I kept it and, and stayed there till I finished my law program. And then you have to come to Makola. So I have to move again to Accra. Mm. That's how come I relocated to Accra and have not gone back anywhere else. Hold it there for me. Samson Lade Anyanini is my guest on PM Personality Profile. Remember, he's a lawyer. He's a broadcast journalist. Two extremely demanding jobs at the same time. When I return from that break, he'll be telling me, or I'll be delving into what went into taking the decision of becoming a journalist and becoming a lawyer. Was it something he really wanted to do right from onset? Again, I'll be finding out from him how he juggles between two, these two difficult jobs. Does he even have time left for the family? Mm -hmm. All of that when we return. <laughs> Welcome back to PM Personality Profile. Samson Ladi Anyanene is still my guest. So throughout your secondary school, university days, did you ever dream of becoming a journalist? I mean, for law, you said you really set out from the one that you wanted to do law. But did it ever cross your mind that you would be a journalist or you would even work in a media house? Um, I, went to, I went to do my national service. Um, after Legon, I went to do my national service at uh, Love FM. And that's how come I, I got uh, to work with the BBC uh, four months into my national service. I got that job. And like I said, um, that meant very good. I, I didn't really think about being a journalist. Um, like I said, I'd gone to Legon to do law. But our year, unfortunately, the law program was uh, curtailed for undergraduates, only for postgraduate students, mm. right. Uh, so whilst at Love FM and getting fortunate to do my work and getting retained by the multimedia and working for the BBC as well, making, you know, some good pounds, <laughs> which I didn't think I would ever make, <laughs> you know, um, I quickly, Enroll. had enough okay. to be able to pay my way to, you know, uh, study law. So KNUSC started the law program, I think somewhere in 2005. Yeah, so the next year or so after they had started, I, I just applied, went in there, you know, paid my fees and started. So I worked at Love FM and then I'll go to school, go to where, go to school, go to school. Yeah, that's it. And then thankfully I finished. And I had to come to Accra, to Makola, as in the School of Law, Ghana School of Law. And that meant relocating. So in Ghana School of Law, I've been doing Joy FM. Um, somehow, whilst I was at Love FM, uh, they, 
management of multimedia wanted me to come to Accra and to assist with editing. Okay. Unfortunately, I couldn't make myself available because if I had moved from love to joy, I would have lost my BBC job. Oh, wow. And that was paying me pounds. Okay. So, so you chose the pounds the over CDs. The motivation was not there. <laughs> then I had also started the LLB law program at KNUSD. Yes. So I came to Accra um, with joy. Uh, I worked as senior broadcast journalist and shortly joined the editorial team mm -hmm. as an editor. So I would, it was easy, not that difficult, even though I must say it takes a lot of, a lot of hard work to do my work as an editor and also go to law school where the law is a very jealous profession Definitely. you have to read read mm -hmm. and read mm -hmm. and you know people get failed and all of that so you must be careful not to but i managed that mm. i managed that what i i did was to arrange to be giving the afternoon shift to edit so i was editor responsible for the afternoon shift so i get up in the morning i go to law school um i close from law school i'm supposed to be in the newsroom latest by one o'clock yeah, so it meant I have to make some sacrifices. So at your time, you yeah. could close at 1 o'clock, you go in um, the morning, because these <laughs> days is the whole day. Yes, uh, we could, there were times we had lectures that go up to 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock, but um, I had to, I had no option, mm. because I'm working and I came to school, so I have to find a way of making up. Mm. So I, I made up. I made up, yeah. Let's talk about mm. your journey to becoming a lawyer. I'll talk right. about you being a young journalist. But since you talked about studying at the law school, you know the agitations, I mean the problems, the troubles we go through to get to the Makola School of Law. Was your story different? Right, so at our time, we're about 200 of us. Um, I think by the time we're, we're getting called to the bar, we're like a half and a little, okay, like <laughs> you know. Yeah, who were getting out. Um, the, the story has not been that, you know, different over the, over the years, mm -hmm. you know. Um, has not been that different. Um, our time, I remember I was SRC president at the uh, School of Law. So I remember my, my whole Law Week uh, speech where I, I bemoaned the fact that the school could not attract, take up as many because of space. And, you know, right after we got information that they were looking at the Kumasi campus and then maybe later there'll be a Gimpa campus, you know, and all these things have happened. So uh, the expansion is good, but it could have been a lot more aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that legal education is very important. Uh, Many, even state institutions, need lawyers, but the lawyers are simply not available. Recently, about uh, over a thousand, thousand and forty-five candidates That's for right. admission into the law school. Yeah. Um, we've been agitating for the law school, uh, the school of law, to open up a good start. Mm. Yeah, that was remark. That was remarkable. That was remarkable. Um, but it could be better because there is there's a backlog. Uh, there's a backlog in excess of, I understand, 2,000 or so who have been trying to enter the law school who have not had the opportunity to do so. Uh, that's not to say that everybody automatically will, will have access. Mm. It's, it's a competitive environment. So, but the state must do what is necessary not to frustrate the dreams of young people and more particularly, as I said, the state actually need lawyers. Look, if you check the statistics, almost 90, close to 90% of lawyers who get called to the bar stay in Accra. Yeah. Stay in Accra. There are regions where you have one person as lawyer for the Attorney General's department. Yeah. What that means is that all the criminal cases that have to be prosecuted, one person in a whole region, of course, they give, the Attorney General gives a fiat to the police to be able to do some of this work. You get it? But in the regions, 
and in the district is not as you find in the capital mm. or in the regional capitals. So, well, not too long ago, the Attorney General herself was bemoaning the fact that she needed, you know, a certain number of, uh, you know, lawyers to hire, but, you know, couldn't. Had to hire about a quarter of that number, okay? So we need to train a lot more lawyers and the state must must do a lot more to open the space. Mm. Um, I belong to the school of thought that says that the various faculties, we are capable of certifying them to be able to do the practical course. Share with me your experiences as a young journalist. I remember the um, story about you being asked to be in an armor car. <laughs> Must have been a bad experience. <laughs> so 2006, by elections at Asawasi, I think, I, I think I'm right about the year. And that's the by-election that brought Muntaka Mubarak to the to parliament mm. and i discovered two pickups loaded with ba ballot papers foreign ballot papers so i blew the alarm <laughs> and that was my crime that was my crime they were impounded i don't know what happened to them later but they were impounded so i was sort of targeted when we're going to the coalition center, then, you know, somehow, some military person, I don't know what his problem is, identified me and said, he, uh, I'm not going to be giving access to the coalition center. I said, that won't happen. You don't have the right to stop me from entering the coalition center. Mm -hmm. He said, you won't enter. I said, you lie, that won't happen. And I was, I was, I was, I was doing a live broadcast. Mm -hmm. Matilda Santi was hosting okay. at Joy. And at the meantime, intermittently, I was reporting for the BBC. Okay. I said, no, I must have access to be able to report. The guy lifted his arm and gave me the military slap. <laughs> he swacked my face. So I sought to protest. I protested yeah. and as I started to talk, he and his colleagues asked me, you, you won't listen, eh? march to the Amod car. There was an Amod car sitting there. Mm. Well, they could force me to the front of the Amod car, but how to get into the Amod car? They asked me to get into it. I said, I wouldn't do that. And they whipped me and asked me to get in there. I said, I won't. Carry me and put me in it. <laughs> I won't. So that was my problem. Okay. And that's where I got quite a bit of beatings. Mm. But the Ashanti Regional Police Commander okay. uh, came to my rescue. Said Ali Yaqub, my editor then, you know, who yes, just right passed right away, please. also came to my rescue and they took me to the hospital. Uh, the next day, uh, uh, the Minister for Defense, Adokufo, mm. uh, said they would do something about it. Uh, if they brought the people before me, can I identify them? So, in a few weeks to elections, um, journalists are confronted again with the issue of covering elections and uh, not leaving any stone on time. But you say no journalist should be intimidated. Right. But it's tough sometimes when men in uniform want to have things go their way. How do we do that well, now whilst I find ensuring. As a lawyer. Mm. I know the law. Okay. So, I preach the law. You don't have to attack the media. In any case, attacking anybody for that matter is a crime of assault. And attacking the media is an additional infraction of the Constitution. And the constitutional rights provided the media to perform their duties. I suppose if we see the media in that light, then those who do that will stop. And we can only continue to also 
uh, request of the security agencies to ensure that their men and women in uniform receive sufficient training to understand that, to understand the limits mm. of the exercise of the powers that the Republic, you know, gives them. For journalists, we must find innovative ways of ensuring that when some of these bullies and, excuse me, ignoramuses try to um, handle, mishandle the journalist. You see, I'm not vouching for any errant journalist. There are some journalists who are terrible. There are journalists who get involved in plain criminal activity. So most importantly, journalists must find ways of gathering the evidence of the illegal and unlawful attack that they suffer. What that also means is that journalists must work together. It doesn't matter which news media you are coming from. If you are on the field covering elections and you see that something is happening to your colleague, you must take the light there. Capture as much as you can to assist. Don't say because the person is not coming from your media house, you will not support. Don't care. And the good people of Ghana who want our democracy to survive, mm -hmm. when you are in the queue voting, you must know that it's the media that gives transparency to what's, what is happening so that your vote is protected. Mm -hmm. If a media person is being attacked, equally, these days, almost everybody is holding some phone. Mm -hmm. Try and help gather the evidence of the wrongdoing mm -hmm. so that they can be assisted to ensure that those who are doing the wrong get punished. I'm taking a lot of notes because definitely in a few weeks we are going to get very busy right. in the field very, very covering, busy. covering elections. Very, very but busy. back to that question, how you juggle between journalism, um, the law, I mean all these demanding jobs, how do you juggle between them and what time is left for the family? <laughs> so once I was called to the bar as a lawyer to start my work, and I started work as a lawyer. Immediately, I left the law school and got called. Um, within a very short time, it became very clear to me that where I was working, Gizis Venice Hughes and Co., the workload was enormous. And it was an enjoying experience. And therefore, I couldn't continue to do journalism and do practice of the law. At the same time. So quickly, I had to resign my work as news editor. Mm. And I have since been hosting Uli News File. Mm. What that means is that it gives me a bit of an allowance. So every day, I go about my work as a lawyer. And thankfully, I have been able to set up a law firm together with my partner and running a law firm of five lawyers. That's uh, quite a number, even to start with. So um, the workload, as far as media work is concerned, has reduced. Yeah. But hosting news file is not a small job. Definitely. So I must stay connected to media almost every day mm -hmm. so I know what is going on mm -hmm. so I can sit on my show and say <laughs> you are misleading or you are telling a lie mm -hmm. and I won't allow you to do that um, and I, you know I also do the law show mm -hmm. so my wife is also a lawyer okay. so there are times she helps me out mm -hmm. so she's become like my producer okay. as far as the law program is concerned mm -hmm. And in the law office, I have very good hands, very capable hands. And my wife is my partner in the law firm. My office, then her office is next. Okay. So, uh, so she helps to make work a little easier in the office for me as well. Okay. Um, she does a lot of the 
a lot of the drafting work. Uh, we do it together, but she does a lot of that. And I joined the other lawyers in the firm to do a lot of the leg work okay. and the advocacy, talking in courtroom. Okay. Yeah, but she finds time to do that, that too as well. So I have some support. Mm. That's, that's, that's the some bottom backbone. line. Yeah, I have some do, support. Do you guys have Very valuable support. Do you have a leisure time at all? Um, I have come a very hard way. Um, leisure, you know, doesn't seem to find much space in my vocabulary. Okay. Uh, but becoming a father has meant that my three small boys deserve my attention. So often, until COVID came in, weekends, um, after news file, Sundays, you know, go, go out, you know, go have fun some places and so on and so forth. And um, yeah, that's, that could be some leisure. Mm -hmm. But in the wake of uh, COVID, <laughs> there's been like zero <laughs> sort of leisure. <laughs> I don't like TV much. Um, if I'm getting to my TV, I like to join Wolf Blitzer, I like to watch Fareed Zakaria. And I just need to get, and these people are churning stuff, so it is not exactly leisure. Mm. Yeah. Once in a while, if the opportunity presents itself, then I like to relax and get a movie or two to watch. To watch. Yeah. And mm. sometimes listen to music. Yes, as for music. Because of my, my crif, <laughs> crif crif background, background. <laughs> yes, uh, in fact, when I was in Legon, and before I got to Legon, mm. um, I made it a point to buy, those days we buy cassettes. Okay. Every, every month, no matter how much money I got, every month, okay. I'll buy at least two cassettes mm. and offering it's uh, foreign gospel. gospel. Okay. Um, of course, the local gospel to uh, some of it have been good to me so I have done them and so that tradition too has also remained with me mm. particularly when I was in Legon then your your loan will come okay. when the loan comes <laughs> uh, the first things I buy I buy one Christian literature okay. and then I buy as many as two three you know gospel. foreign gospel cassettes okay. of course also because I was in a choir mm. and you need to learn the new songs as in when they come in and mm. you must sing new songs and and as a praise as a praise leader too okay so yeah. which um what were you singing auto tenor bass i i did bass um i lead okay. you know yeah so and like i said i do praise worship yeah i did i did a lot of that uh, but i was born into catholic church mm. because of my mom okay. and then I moved out, okay. uh, moved out, went to Deeper Life, went to House of Faith Ministries and stayed there for a long time until about um, uh, almost a decade ago, I retraced my steps back, back into the Catholic the Church. The goodness of God has indeed found <laughs> you and that's why I guess you love mm. this uh, goodness of song by what, Dante? Dante Boy. The Lord. Oh, your mercies never fail me In all my days I've been held in your hands Then I wake up To hold my hand And I sing Of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Right 
interesting. Samson Ladi Anjanini is my guest. And definitely, I know you exercise a lot. So I need see. that because if I don't do that, I'm getting up and I can read very late into the night sometimes because of the work that we do as lawyers. The workload. You, you, you can read into, into the next morning. Okay. Yeah. And so, read, write. We push paper. That's our job. We just push paper. Um, if you don't have to go to court, then it means you are not working a bit. You know. Of course, the court, the court, um, court complex. You know, doing all the steps up and down. It's a bit of exercise that you must be deliberate about exercising. So there's a time I I relaxed. So my what my wife did was that on my birthday, she just went to register me with a, a gym in the area. And so I started, I went for about one month, one stop. Before I said Jack, then I was slugging again. <laughs> so I said, okay, create a small gym in your home. That's yeah, a very small, so that any time at all, you can, you can just get in there and, and you know, do yeah. Do I get yeah. the opportunity to um, be in your gym today. Yes, for as long as my wife approves it. Yeah. <laughs> mm. I'm lucky. So, viewers, yeah. let's get into the gym <laughs> and <laughs> see how it goes. Uh. <laughs> Thank you so much for talking to You're us. You're welcome. So You're welcome. Talking to Samson Ladi. I mean, really. Best journalist of the year 2019. <laughs> uh. My name is Aisha Brian. Many thanks for watching. Same time next week, another exciting edition of Pimp Atlantic Profile awaits you. Enjoy the rest of us.